Okay, today we're going to be in uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Remember that Colossians is all about the preeminence and sufficiency of Christ in all things. Here's our quiz from, uh, we did a uh, really uh, sort of a in-depth study of verses 1 and 2 uh, prior to the break for Christmas and New Year's. So we'll just do a little quick quiz from there. True or false, Christ is sitting on David's throne in heaven. As king of the spiritual kingdom, he's operating on the earth right now. Uh, that's absolutely false. There's a lot of people that believe some variation of this, that uh, somehow there's a kingdom in operation right now, that Jesus is operating somehow from heaven. And uh, scripture sure doesn't indicate that. Um, this is said to be Satan's kingdom right now. He's the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, and so forth. Um, Jesus is not, he's, he is, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this, he's sort of the king in waiting right now, but he's not uh, in any way t uh, running a spiritual kingdom on the earth right now. Uh, true or false, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father as head of the church, great high priest, one mediator between God and man. That's certainly what Scripture says. He is the king in waiting after the Israel rejected him in his first coming. Um, he could have been king if, if, had they accepted him, and he could have brought the kingdom in, but it depended on Israel enthroning him as the king. And they did not do that. They rejected him. So Jesus, if you read the Gospel of Matthew, rejected him. And Jesus postponed the kingdom until another time. And so just like in the typology that we're given about King David, remember King David was anointed king, but Saul was the actual king. So David was sort of the king in waiting as well. So just like that uh, typology, Jesus is the anointed king, but Satan is the ruler of this world right now. So that's, that's true. Very, very kind of neat typology. Um, true or false, Israel should continue obeying the Mosaic law today, even though the temple where the required sacrifices to be offered was destroyed in 70 AD. That's false. Um, actually, we're told that at the cross, the Mosaic law was made inoperative. The, the Jews have no way of carrying out the Mosaic Law, which required a lot of animal sacrifices on an altar there in Jerusalem. And to do that required them to have their temple in operation um, and the Holy of Holies in operation and all of that kind of thing. And uh, it doesn't exist today. It, it will exist again in the uh, in the uh, tribulation time, there will be a tribulation temple that will be in operation. And in the millennial kingdom, there will be a, a temple. But uh, they cannot carry that out right now. So uh, the Jews are, are stuck right now. They're on the bench. Uh, they're being basically disciplined by God. Um, and they're going to come under the wrath of God. The day of the Lord's wrath is coming on them severely after the rapture of the church. There are Jews and Gentiles alike have the opportunity to join the church today and avoid this wrath. Uh, but there is an awful lot of Jews who are going to go right into the day of the Lord's wrath, rejecting Jesus. True or false, Jesus instructed the church to focus its efforts on building the kingdom while he was gone. And he told us he would return when we got that done. That's false. I, you know, I don't know where people come up with this stuff. It's, it's not in Scripture. Um, our instructions come from the epistles. And in the epistles, you don't, you don't see uh, us being told to build a kingdom. Uh, there's, there's none of that in there. But for some reason, the, the church gets confused with Israel a lot because people can't read plainly and make the distinction between the church and Israel. Uh, true or false, the most effective prayer the church could pray right now is for the second coming of Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords to set up his kingdom. And he's sure to hear us uh, and answer that prayer. Uh, the apostles frequently prayed for this as documented in the epistles. See, that's false. That's, uh, go to the epistles and read. You don't, you don't see the apostles 
apostles praying for the kingdom to come in. They're praying for the rapture of the church. They're praying for the church to be completed and for Christ to come and rescue the church off the earth uh, because they know that the day of the Lord's wrath has to come next. So they're not praying for, praying for the second coming of Christ as King of Kings. They're praying for the uh, basically the church to be completed and the rapture of the church to occur. So the church is so uh, untaught as to the plan of God that uh, you have all of these people uh, meeting and you know, singing about Jesus as the king and um, worshiping as king and all, all these various things and trying to carry out kingdom work on the earth today. And it's just, uh, it's just so wrong. They're just not, they're not, I mean, if you can read properly, you read the Bible and, and try and understand what's going on and uh, get teachers who can teach uh, clearly what is going on here. You will not uh, see these kinds of things happening. Okay, so here's our verses uh, from chapter 3 of Colossians 1 through 11. Um, verse 1, therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, and remember we went in depth on these, so I'm not going to spend much time here. If you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. So Paul's writing clearly, he's writing to Christians. They've been raised up with Christ. And uh, we said the use of if here, Greek is powerful in that it, the word if can be, has four different classes of conditions can be used in four different ways. Here it's a first class conditional, which means that it assumes that it's true. Or you could just say since since you've been raised up with Christ, and therefore they should keep seeking the things above. Uh, the Gnostics, not the Gnostic higher knowledge, but the things where Christ is today. So zeteo is the word for seek. It means to desire, investigate, examine, try to obtain, investigate, seek information about. So where do we do that? Well, we go to the scriptures and we investigate that, and we depend on the Holy Spirit to teach us and instruct us and guide us uh, in the Word of God about these things. It's an active verb, so it's something for us to do. Uh, today is uh, January 1st, 2022, a great uh, time for you to get started in your uh, active uh, one-year Bible reading and study of the Bible every single day. Active verb for us to do. So it's an exhortation, command, polite request for us to keep doing this. Verse 2, set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. Set is the second command Paul gives the believers in Colossae. Uh, set is phroneo. It means to ponder or let one's mind dwell on, keep thinking about, be intent on, fix one's attention on. And this is a present tense active imperative verb. So this is to be ongoing and you are exhorted to do it with no end in sight. So you've probably heard that expression, well, that person's so heavenly minded, he's of no earthly good. And that's exactly the wrong approach, according to verse 2 here, because we should be very heavenly minded so that we are earthly good. Uh, so that, that expression doesn't match up at all with Paul's exhortation. He would have uh, laughed you uh, right out of the uh, church if you'd have said something like that. So remember, we did a mini study on these first two verses, and so understanding them is the key to not being deceived by kingdom now and lordship, false teaching uh, that is predominant today in evangelical and even Bible uh, churches today. So here's a link to that study. Verse 3, for you have died, your life is hidden with Christ and God. So the reason we should be seeking the things above, setting our minds on the things above, is that we have died with Christ and now have a new life that's hidden with Christ and God. Died is this word uh, apathonete, and Paul uses this word of dying to sin in Romans and to the law in Galatians. Similarly, here, it's not a physical death, but it's a spiritual death. It's a change of status of life. Uh, it's an aorist verb, meaning that it was at a point of time you died. Well, in context, that's when you believe the gospel. You died to the person you were uh, who was once separated from God. You were an enemy of God. And when you believed the gospel, uh, when you believed, 
you were separated from that life referred to as being in Adam. When you're born, you're, you're born in Adam. We're all descendants of Adam. And this is where you were and everyone was since the fall of Adam and Eve who experience a natural birth. That's a procreation birth. That's where we all came from. We all inherited a sin nature that we were born separated from God by that sin nature and therefore we stood condemned by God. But God made it possible for all of us to not remain in that state. He did this by sending his only begotten son. An only begotten son, uh, the word in Greek is the monogenes, uh, John 3, 16, which means his unique, only, one of a kind son. is the second person of the Trinity to add humanity to his deity and atone for all of our sins and reconcile us to God. So when you believe the gospel, you died to that natural person that you were in Adam, and you were supernaturally then born again from above. At the instant you believed, that is, you trusted that Christ died for your sins and was raised from the dead, you were baptized or identified into Christ. This is not a wet baptism, it's a dry baptism. You were baptized into Christ by the Holy Spirit. You were no longer condemned in Adam, but you were justified in Christ. When you believed the gospel, your life then became hidden with Christ in God. And at that very instant, you received eternal life, zoe, or resurrection life, eternal life. This new kind of life is in the resurrected Christ, who is hidden from the world today since he ascended from this earth 2,000 years ago and is currently seated with God the Father in heaven. And this is where we should be seeking the things above and setting our minds. So verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also be, will be revealed with him in glory. So at the second coming of Christ, that is when he returns to the earth to set up his kingdom, Christ will be revealed to the world. And prior to that, he's going to come back to this atmosphere. It's called coming back in the air for his church in the rapture. The world's not going to see him at that time. Only the church will see him at the rapture. And when he comes to set up his kingdom, however, he's going to be revealed to the whole world in all of his glory the God-man who is then going to be the king of kings revealed is this word phanero'o, which means to make appear, make visible, cause to be seen or exposed publicly. So in his first coming, Christ came to fulfill the first coming prophecies. And I've listed uh, some of those here. You can look those up if you'd like. And he came to offer the kingdom to Israel as their true Messiah, as per the covenant promises that were made to them in 2 Samuel 7. They rejected him. Jesus postponed the kingdom. This is what the Gospel of Matthew documents. This is what the Gospel of Matthew is all about. He came to seek and save the lost, which he did accomplish when he voluntarily died on the cross, bearing the sin penalty for all men, paying that penalty in full, and then he rose again from the dead, overcoming death and hell in the grave. And as a sign that God accepted his sacrifice as the one time, once sufficient payment. All men were now savable on the basis of what Jesus had accomplished. And this is what the Gospel of John documents. Now all people who would trust Christ and what Christ has done for them, they receive the free gift of forgiveness of their sin debt which is a wonderful thing to begin with, but they also receive a new position before God who now judges them as righteous. He declares them in his courtroom uh, as righteous. Having accomplished his work on the earth in his first coming, Jesus was then taken back to heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father. And from here, uh, as scripture says very clearly, he sits as the head of the church, the one mediator between God and man, 
and our great high priest. But additionally, he is the king in waiting. Again, we we'll go back to the typology of uh, King David. He's waiting for the plan of God to be carried out in the Father's timing. The Father is the great planner uh, of this whole uh, orchestration of things from the creation uh, all the way through the new creation from Genesis 1 through Revelation 22. So this includes the completion of the church first, then the rapture of the church to heaven, then the day of the Lord's wrath is going to be executed on the unbelieving world. So this wrath will end at the exact moment when a remnant of Israel who will come to faith during this awful period of God's wrath meets the condition Jesus gave them in Matthew 23, 39, where he says, this is his farewell speech to Israel. It's called the Olivet Discourse. For I say to you from now on, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Paul gives us some additional history and detail on this in Romans 10. Romans 9, 10, and 11 uh, talk about uh, Israel, the nation of Israel. As the church, we have no influence over the plan of God for the timing of the coming kingdom. So the church has really no business and no priority uh, to be doing things that, that we talk about kingdom. Uh, people talk about kingdom men, bringing in the kingdom, doing kingdom work. Really, we have nothing to do with the kingdom. Uh, we are sons of the kingdom, we're inheritors of the kingdom, but we, we have no influence over the kingdom. When we give the gospel to people, they become sons of the kingdom and inheritors of the kingdom. But in terms of bringing the kingdom in or acting like the kingdom is here right now, that's just not even right. So we're given priorities for this current age uh, and things that we can influence uh, during this time called the dispensation of the church or the stewardship of the church. And these come from the epistles. They don't come from the gospels. They don't come from the Old Testament. Uh, they don't come from the book of Revelation. They come from the epistles. Uh, the top three priorities for the church as a whole are the glory of God, Ephesians 3.21, the building up of the saints, Ephesians 4.12, and the making of disciples, which is 2 Corinthians 6.18-20. We're Christ ambassadors here now, bringing divine viewpoint that the Holy Spirit has taught us in the Word of God on all matters, to the nations. We are ministers of reconciliation, making known that believing the gospel of God's Son is sinful man's only means of obtaining a right relationship with the one true God. So that's basically the two functions that we, we have here. We pray for the fullness of the Gentiles to come in and that we will effectively prepare for and carry out our part in this ministry which is how the Great Commission gets done during the age of the church. The Holy Spirit is in the world today, convicting all men of their need for Christ. That's his primary mission to the lost world today. Uh, the church cooperates with the Holy Spirit by preaching and teaching the clear gospel message. So the saints will be equipped in ministry. And then all who come under the Spirit's conviction will hear the gospel, believe and be saved. And those who believe are called the choice ones or the elect of God. And they are immediately regenerated, indwelt, baptized, and sealed by the Holy Spirit, becoming part of the church. They are transferred from this position called in Adam, where they were condemned, to in Christ, where they are now uh, justified and are now part of the bride of Christ, the church. Now, when the fullness of all these believers, mostly Gentiles, is reached, the church will be complete. Then the church is caught up, raptured to heaven, with the dead in Christ rising first, those of us who are alive joining them in the clouds to meet Christ in the air. Christ doesn't come back all the way to the earth and touch the earth to get the church, rapture the church. He just comes back in the air. And we will return to heaven with him to be forever with him and share in his destiny, which we learned about in the book of Ephesians. 
uh, but the rapture description is given to us in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. In our new glorified bodies will appear at the Bema Seat judgment of Christ and be rewarded for our good works done from the time we were justified to the time we were glorified, that is during our sanctification. And this is our loyalty to Christ will be rewarded. This is 2 Corinthians 5.10. And as part of that, our assignments in the kingdom will be given so it's all exciting to think about Christ's second coming, but for the church, that's not what is next on God's calendar of prophetic events. The, the rapture is. So if we have our priorities confused, we're gonna be put in the proverbial cart before the horse if we start thinking kingdom stuff. We have no influence over when the kingdom comes. That's entirely up to that remnant of Jewish believers. And that comes only after the day of the Lord's wrath occurs. We're not involved in any of that, have no influence whatsoever in that timing. Uh, Matthew 24, 25 describes the events leading up to the kingdom. The church is not found anywhere in Matthew 24 and 25. Remember the gospel of Matthew is written to uh, Jewish believers who believed that Jesus was the true Messiah. Uh, they had believed in him, but they said, of, uh, we believe that he was the true Messiah, but where, where's the kingdom? How come the kingdom didn't come? And Matthew explains why the kingdom didn't come. The nation of Israel did not enthrone Jesus as the rightful king, the rightful Messiah in the line of David, according to 2 Samuel 7. So that's what Matthew really is truly all about. The book of Revelation is the detail of both Daniel 9, 24, 27 and Matthew 24, 25. It parallels these uh, very closely. When Christ returns as the King of Kings, it's after God has put all his enemies under his feet. Um, the eviction steps that are taken are called the seal and trumpet and bowl judgments by God that removes every God-hating, God-rejecting human being from this earth. Uh, these are the people who hate God, who don't want God on this earth. Uh, they believe the earth belongs to them. They would much rather follow Satan than have anything to do with God. And they believe the earth belongs to them. And so God said, no, earth belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's gonna be the King of Kings. And so to uh, evict them, uh, God is going to take these eviction steps. And these are all accounted in the seal, trumpet, and bowl judgments that God uses uh, during this particular time. So at the end of this period called the tribulation or seven-year period, a remnant of Israel, this will be Jews who have become believers during this terrible day of the Lord, will cry out for Jesus, just as it says in Matthew 23, 31. He will come and deliver them and bring in this promised kingdom. And that is how the wrath of the God is finally ended and the blessing of God's kingdom begins. So you can see the church has nothing to do with uh, the coming of the kingdom. That's all up to uh, God's plan and how Israel responds. When Christ returns in his glory, we, however, return with him. We'll have received our glorified bodies as the third phase of our salvation. Remember, there's three tenses to our salvation, justification, which came first, sanctification, which is happening to us now after we became a believer. Now we're being sanctified and then after our death or the rapture, we, be, we receive a glorified body, become glorified. Uh, well, when Christ returns in all his glory as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we return in glory as his bride, as co-inheritors with Christ, and as co-rulers of the kingdom. You know, talk about high visibility and high honor, doesn't get much better than that. The church, which has been mocked and kicked around like a bunch of discarded trash during these times, the current evil age, will then be in this position of great power and authority and respect because of our unique relationship to Christ, who will then be functioning as King of Kings, Lord of Lords over all things, undisputed. 
you will hear people talk about being on the right side of history and they use this now as a talking point to slap down biblical viewpoint uh, and people that you know are people in the church but at the second coming of Christ I think it's going to become really crystal clear who is actually on the right side of history Verse 5, therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. The therefore means that there is something we should conclude or do as a result of these first four verses. And here is that something. We should necrosate, put to death, mortify, stop completely, cease completely the use of our earthly body for committing sins of carnality. It's an aorist active imperative verb. It means action we are exhorted to have taken in the past. Using your body for all kinds of immorality, impurity, etc. was something that the Gnostics had no problem with. And they, in fact, they promoted it uh, since they were teachers of what was called dualism. Body was basically evil. Whatever you did with it didn't count. It was really the spirit that counted. So Paul disagreed uh, with do the dualistic approach of the Gnostics and uh, don't use your body for a vehicle for sin. He taught this earlier in the book of Romans uh, 6, 6, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. In our sanctification, the power of that sin nature has been broken. We don't have to obey it anymore, but the sin nature is not dead. It still wants to control us. The only way to beat it is by walking in the Spirit. That's what Paul says in Galatians 5.16. But I say walk by the Spirit, you'll not carry out the desire of the flesh. The flesh is uh, just used as, uh, it means the sin nature. You can't do it by your own power. You can't defeat the sin nature in your own power. Yet so many Christians are trying to do just that. Very frustrated Christians, I'll guarantee you. For some reason, they have never been taught to walk in the Spirit. Rather, they're being taught uh, they have to pull all their human efforts into submission to Christ as Lord, or they were never saved to begin with. This is part of that false gospel called Lordship Salvation, and it is destroying the church and making many miserable, struggling Christians who are trying their best to do what that doctrine calls for. Christians have been given the indwelling spirit because God knows we cannot live the Christian life through our own efforts. If we choose to walk in the spirit, the Holy Spirit will fulfill the law of Christ in us, Romans 8, 4, and you will have the testimony of the Holy Spirit with your spirit that you are the children of God. If you learn nothing from reading the Old Testament, read about Israel after they received the Mosaic Law, and you will see failure after failure after failure. Read the book of Galatians, and Paul explains to you how the Jews failed to be able to keep uh, the Law of Moses, and how these Judaizers had come to the church um, where Paul had taught them the gospel of grace, and these Judaizers were trying to put people back under the law. It's the same thing as lordship salvation they're trying to do to you today. Do not let them do that to you. You can walk in the Spirit who will accomplish the law of Christ in you and through you. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience, and in them you also once walked when you were living in them. Sons of disobedience is a technical term for the unbelievers, and verse 7 says you were once, uh, you were an unbeliever once. The term is never, never used of believers. So unbelievers are constantly obeying their sin nature because they have no other choice. They're accumulating God's righteous anger, which will take the form of punishment against them. Romans 1, 18 through 32 shows how people, <coughs> people incur this wrath. Uh, verse, um, sorry, take a little drink here. Uh, verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them. 
For since the creation of the world is invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies wouldn't be dishonored among them. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness and wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful, although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty, hearty approval to those who practice them. The ultimate wrath of God is executed at the great white throne judgment where men will be judged by Christ. No believers ever appear here. The punishment for having rejected the free gift of salvation will be eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. Revelation 20.11 says that I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, and every one of them according to their deeds. Then death and Hades, were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Believers never face the wrath of God. Why? Jesus already took that for us. He stepped in as our substitute. He took all the punishment we deserved on himself. Jesus paid it all. No, so now rather than wrath, we who have believed are treated as sons and daughters and are disciplined by the Father. Hebrews 12, 7, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Therefore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as seemed best to them. But he disciplines us as, our, as for our good, so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, is yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness." Another great sanctification verse is Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Romans 6, 8 is all about sanctification, not justification. So even our sins as a saved person can't cause God to ever condemn us since Christ already paid for those as well. We'll face the discipline of the Father who loves us 
will be out of fellowship with Christ until we confess our sins using 1 John 1, 9, but we will never, ever be condemned. Our sins may even cost our physical life, but it'll never cost us our justification. Obviously, abusing drugs and alcohol can destroy your health and lead to death, and God may even take our lives in what is considered a premature death. 1 John 5.16 says, If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask God, and God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make a request for this. What that sin is is not made known to us. A couple of sins in the early church were, <laughs> that was <coughs> Acts 5, 1 through 11, um, and then 1 Corinthians 5, 5 and eleven thirty. But walk, <coughs> walking in the Spirit is the key to the Christian life and to your sanctification. <coughs> But now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. Now that we're believers and have the ability to walk in the Spirit, our behavior needs to reflect the walk in the Spirit. This means putting aside all the above kinds of stuff. These are all indicators that you have chosen to walk in the flesh. If you're going to talk like this and so forth, these are examples of carnal behaviors and carnal speech that just doesn't fit who you are anymore as a temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Lie is a present tense imperative. Apparently this is a particular sin the Colossians had continued in uh, after they had been justified. They should stop this now because it's part of the evil practices of the past. It no longer fits who they are. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Today Christians are way too comfortable with lies. This is Satan's character. He's a liar and a murderer from the beginning. When we cannot discern truth from lies, be it doctrinal truth or what passes for science or politics today, we are way too comfortable with Satan's worldview and not a biblical worldview. Believing those and repeating those as a member of the body of Christ is injurious to God's name, which is the very definition of blasphemy. Put on the full armor of God's God every morning so you don't fall for these lies and schemes. A few examples of Christians taking the position of the evolutionist, that's blasphemy. God said, I created all of it. And you're saying, no, I don't think God, God must have lied about that. I believe in ev evolution. That's injurious to God's name. That's blasphemy of God. A Christian supporting homosexuality is blasphemy. God said it's, it's an abomination. A Christian supporting a woman's right to choose movement. Blasphemy. All of these are sin against God. And when we take these public stands as Christians and defend these things that are contrary to what God has revealed to us, we're injuring God's name and we're leading others astray and are acting in unison with Satan against God. That's the end of Romans 1.32. Although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Our current president and speaker of the house come to mind as people that fit this description pretty clearly. Verse 10, and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free man. Christ is all in all. We are no longer these people, no longer to act like these people. In this new self that we became the moment we believed the gospel, we began to be renewed. Renewed is anakino, a present tense verb, but it's passive. It's being done to us rather than us doing it to ourselves. What does it mean being renewed? Well, it tells us that we are being made new, being restored. But being made new or restored to what? to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created us. It's further described as being a renewal in which there's no distinction between groups of people. Talk about racism. There's no racism in the church uh, because they're all in Christ and he is all in all. So this is a process that's happening to the Christian, no matter whether Gentile, Jew, male, female, slave, free, renewals to a perfect knowledge in Christ not the false knowledge of the Gnostics and false teachers. 
It began when we put our faith in Christ that the Holy Spirit regenerated, indwelt, baptized, and sealed us. All the superficial differences we recognize when we look at people disappear when we, re when we consider the believer as in Christ. Paul may have listed all these groups like Jews and Greeks and Scythians and slaves and all this because it was very much the demographic of that church in Colossae. Well, some applications here. Christians are called uh, to live differently. By Christians, Paul means those who have believed the true gospel and have the power of the sin nature broken in their lives. They have the ability to walk in the spirit where our lives are said to be hidden with Christ, although we can, can and do choose not to walk in the spirit at times. As we mature, we trust him more and more through the renewing of our minds by the Spirit's teaching ministry of the Word of God to us, and we choose to walk in him more and more. As we learn the Word of God, we become more and more effective ambassadors of Christ wherever we go. We're able to bring his divine viewpoint that we have been taught by the Holy Spirit to every matter and every situation. This is in opposition to the lies and schemes of the God of this world, the devil. The world's deceived by Satan. We bring biblical viewpoint against the deception of the people who are lost. This is why we can't go along with theory of evolution, gender confusion, redefinitions and in institutions of marriage and family, all these efforts to distort sexuality as in the LGBTQ, blah, 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 transhumanism, planned depopulation, climate change that prioritizes the earth and the animals over mankind. We have a responsibility to bring divine viewpoint to these areas. We're also called as ministers of reconciliation. Holy Spirit is in the world today, convicting the lost world of their need for Christ. We're to be equipped to present the one true gospel that saves. Christ died for your sins, according to the scriptures. God raised him from the dead, according to the scriptures. He has done everything needed for you to be saved. Believe this good news and be saved. Reject it and remain under the condemnation of God. That's the basic message of the gospel, where it becomes a false gospel and one that doesn't save Anybody is when that person is required to do something other than believe. Anytime you inject something the person can or must do as an added condition, it's a false gospel. It's 100% Jesus and 0% you. If you've added works to the grace offer God has made available, it's no longer a valid offer. Titus 3.5, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, Repenting of your sins comes after you're saved. Being baptized comes after you have believed. Coming under the Lordship of Jesus comes after you've been saved and actually means walking in the Spirit. Praying a sinner's prayer, asking Jesus into your heart, raising your hand, walking an aisle, joining a church, are not found anywhere in Scripture as equivalent of believing. At the same time, our primary focus is on the things above. We can't get so concerned about the things below that we forget who we are and where we're headed. What looks like the world falling apart is really God's plan falling into place. We simply are carrying out our instructions for this dispensation. The timing and results belong to God. So we get up, put on the armor of God, set our minds on the things above, choose to walk in the spirit, anticipate that this could be the day. The day means the rapture. The rapture could be today and we could be in heaven with the Lord faster than the blink of an eye. Until then, Maranatha.